Uh, good evening. Welcome, everybody, on a cold and, and wet night, but uh, the bounty of Mother Nature is matched by the bounty of the experience of our speaker tonight, uh, who is one of the true, I think, statesmen of the Arab world today. Uh, there are not many statesmen or women in our region, unfortunately. There are some, but not as many as we'd like, and he's one of them. We're very uh, honored to have Lakhtar Brahimi as our speaker tonight in the latest um, uh, speaker in the series of the Bill and Sally Hambrecht Distinguished Peacemakers Lectures at AUB. This is a series that has been going on for about two years and will finish later this year. Uh, we have some very interesting speakers still to come. Amr Musa is coming in February, uh, Aaron Miller is coming in May, and uh, one or two others still that we're working on. And this is a very distinguished and experienced group of men and women who have had uh, significant real life experience in mediating political conflicts. And our aim in putting together this series, and Bill and Sally Hambrecht, who so generously uh, funded it, is to bring together people who've had mediating political mediation and peacemaking, peacekeeping experiences all over the world to really learn the many, many lessons that we can learn from, uh, from their experiences, both their successes and, and their failures. Um, Lakhtar Brahimi uh, is, was high on our list and we were so pleased that he was able to come. Uh, I've known him for, uh, for some years and every time I sit with him I, I learn something new, as I'm sure you will tonight. He will talk about his reflections on UN experiences in the Middle East and Afghanistan and, and, and other places. Um, I'll tell you just briefly his background. He was former Algerian foreign minister and ambassador, and then he left uh, national service in 1993 officially to, or, or to move over to a new career in the United Nations in international uh, diplomacy and mediation, mainly working for the UN. Uh, which he did until 2005, even though every once in a while the Secretary General keeps calling him on him to do more things. Uh, he's a member of the Elders, a group of elder statesmen and personalities that was created in, nine, in 2007 at the initiative of Nelson Mandela that has people like Mary Robinson and Jimmy Carter and Bishop Tutu and um, um, Sadiq al-Mahdi and some very distinguished international uh, leaders. Um, and in 1988, to 90, he helped to mediate the end of the 17-year civil war in Lebanon uh, at the Ta'if Agreement, and on behalf of the League of Arab States then, he has served as the United Nations Secretary General, Special Envoy or Mediator uh, in Afghanistan, South Africa, Iraq. Uh, he's done work in Lebanon, Haiti, uh, Sudan, uh, and many other places around the world, and partly as a acknowledgement of this extraordinary wealth of experience that he has and his, his own sort of measured calm wisdom. Uh, he was asked to chair an independent panel that was established by Secretary General Kofi Annan to review the entire peacemaking, uh, peacekeeping operations of the United Nations. And this report was endorsed by the Millennium Summit in September 2000 and it, was, it has ever since been known as the Brahimi Report. And ever since the year 2000, any United Nations peacekeeping or peacemaking operation around the world has been based on the principles that came out of uh, the Brahimi report. Uh, so, and he's done many other things, um, but these are the highlights that I just wanted to mention. Um, he will talk for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll have a, he'll sit down and we'll have a, a question and answer and uh, open discussion. So please, uh, Join me in welcoming Lakhtar Brahimi. Thank you very, very much indeed, uh, Rami. Uh, what you have told, I think, the audience is that I'm not that young anymore, which is, I think, uh, visible. And if you tell me it is not visible, I'll say thank you very much, but I feel otherwise. Um, I'm really very happy to be back at uh, AUB, uh, honored, privileged, uh, and grateful to you, uh, Rami, and uh, 
to you, Kerry Maktese, for this invitation. Uh, this is uh, peacekeeping, peacemaking, mediation has been at the center of my activities and indeed of my life for the last uh, 20 years at least. Uh, when people tell me what lessons I have learned, I say generally that uh, in the best of times, uh, what I have learned is that uh, to make mistakes, but to make new ones, not the, the same ones. Uh, that's, I think, the best that one can learn, because it's just impossible not to make mistakes in this uh, particular field. Um, uh, Rami has mentioned lots of uh, places uh, that I have been to, including Haiti. Uh, I think you see it on your television screen every day, and uh, it is really terrible what happened there. And I think we should spare a thought for all the people who work there. The United Nations has lost maybe 100, 100 people, 150 people there. Uh, the lessons that one has learned have to do with, I think, two or three essential things. The first thing is what I call for want of a better world, for want of a better word, knowledge. When you go somewhere, uh, of course, you try and learn as much as you can. You read a lot of reports, you read, you read even books if you have time. Uh, but I think if uh, uh, you really want to do a good job, you've got to remind yourself almost every minute that you don't know enough. And that you need to find out more and more and more. And that the situation changes. By definition, uh, conflict and post-conflict situations, like everything else actually, are very dynamic situations. They are not static. They change all the time. And the military, as a matter of fact, have taught us that, uh, as they put it, I think, uh, the best battle plan does not survive the first bullet. And this makes perfect sense. You, you, you prepare a battle plan in your equivalent of the Pentagon, whatever that may be, but when you actually land in the war theater, as soon as you start fighting, the situation has changed, already changed. And it will keep changing every hour, every day, every week, and you have got to, to adapt uh, to, to, to that situation. This is what I often sometimes call, as a matter of fact, this word I used for the first time in Lebanon, uh, you need to do a lot of navigation by sight. Uh, you know, as the captain of your ship, you of course equip yourself with uh, the best instruments that you can, you have the best maps that are available, but you have got to, uh, again, keep reminding yourself that maybe there is a rock that is not on your map, and you will hit it unless your eyes are wide open. Or the weather may change, and the forecasts are uh, not, not very accurate. So you need to do a lot of uh, uh, navigation uh, by sight. About you know, the necessity of learning and the fact that no matter how hard you try, you don't know enough. And more dangerously, you sometimes are misinformed. Uh, when I was appointed to go to Afghanistan for the first time in 1997, uh, in, in addition to reading everything I could find, and talking to the people in the UN who had worked in Afghanistan, 
before me, I also managed to get five noted experts on Afghanistan. One Afghan, one Pakistani, one Australian, one American, and a Frenchman couldn't come, but I, I, I talked to him later. I think an obvious question I ask these experts is, uh, you know, people say that Afghanistan is a tribal society. Uh, is it really still a tribal society? This is a country where there was uh, you know, a, a, more, a fairly modern constitution in 1964 uh, by the King Zahir Shah. In 1973, his cousin and prime minister, Sardar um, Daoud Khan, staged a coup d'etat against him. In 1978, the communists staged a coup d'etat against uh, Sardar Khan, and there were several communist coup d'etat against one another. Then the Soviet Union came in in 79. Then the Soviet Union was pushed out, and the Mujahideen, who had successfully defeated the, the, the Soviet Union, took over. In 1994, the Taliban appeared on the scene. 1996, they took the capital. In, 19, in 2000, or thereabout, they completed practically the occupation of 90% of uh, of, uh, of Afghanistan. So in 97, was, uh, you know, instead, in spite of all these developments, was Afghanistan just the tribal war that uh, we read about in, in, in uh, 19th century uh, travel books? Of course not. How has it changed? Who are the actors that you are, you are, you are, you are going to, to, to deal with? And these five experts with whom I talked, and a lot of other people, of course they told me, you are right, it's not quite the same tribal society it was, but they, were, they did not agree with one another exactly what, was, what society looked like. When I went there, I, I started you know, seeing how complicated the situation is, and if you ask me to describe it in detail now, I'm not sure that I can give you an exact photographic picture of what the situation looks like. That, it is that complicated. More important to your work as, as, as a mediator, uh, there were other questions. One of them was, there is, you know, we are talking about 97, and then 2001. You are talking about a civil war between factions that were fighting against the uh, Russians and then turned against one another. V very simple questions. How many people were involved in this fighting? I made several statements in 1997-98 saying that the people of Afghanistan, all 25 million of them, were hostage to a maximum of 50,000 fighters. So we thought that, you know, probably I, you know, for the benefit of this kind of statement, you diminish a little bit the numbers. Maybe there was 70,000. All the factions, Northern Alliance with its four or five factions, the Taliban, Hakmetyar, 70,000. In 2001, when the Taliban fell, we discovered that the Taliban alone had 100, 150,000 fighters, uh, 120,000, the Taliban alone. So, you know, when you are that far off the mark, you can't possibly do a good job in, in, in your mediation because you are talking to people, you don't know what kind of strength they really have. So it's, uh, you know, it's not good enough. Um, Something that is important for our region, the so-called Arab Afghans. Of course, there were many, although that many is what? Again, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, when the Soviets were there. I hear now that there may have been in all during the 10 years, maybe as, as many as 100,000. I definitely didn't know that. But 
That is the past, as far as I was concerned, in 97, 98, 2000, and so on. How many were still there then? Again, the best guesses that we, we, we had was that foreigners involved in the fighting in, in Afghanistan were maybe 7,000, 8,000, if you want, you know, really to be on the safe side and exaggerate these numbers, you say 10,000. How many Arabs? Maybe, again, in exaggeration, I was told, for example, that there was something like 700 Egyptians. And all Arabs taken together, maybe 3,000. In 2001, we discovered that the Arabs alone were about 10,000. Only the Arabs. Uh, the Pakistanis were thought to be about 4,000. There were more than 10,000. And people from Central Asia all the way to Chechnya, maybe 2,000. You see, there again, if you, 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 you don't know, uh, uh, you know these basic facts, your work will definitely be uh, negatively, negatively affected. To diminish that negative effect on your work, it helps a lot to be conscious that your knowledge is imperfect and in need of constant improvement. This is the, the main lesson. The other lesson that one learns, and also in a place like Afghanistan is, is, is ideal for that, is not to underestimate others and not to overestimate your own capacity, your own skills, uh, your own wisdom, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, a friend of mine told me you must be very careful with Afghans because they give you the impression all the time that you are manipulating them. Actually, they are manipulating you all the time. So one has to be, you know, very, very careful. One has also to keep, to keep learning how to read uh, facts, how to understand facts, how to understand what you are told, how to understand what you see. And this, I think, I have learned a little bit earlier than going to Afghanistan. When I heard uh, the following story, I'm sorry if some of you have already heard it, maybe even from me. It concerns you know, the old days when there were borders in Europe. And there was a man going on a bicycle from France into Spain. So he would stop by the customs, anything to declare, say, no, I have nothing to declare, say, but you know, on the back of your bicycle there is this bag. What is in it? He said, there's sand only. Say, open it, they open it, yes, it is sand. Why are you taking sand to Spain? Say, well, if there is any duty to pay, I'll pay it. It's not none of your business. I'm taking sand to Spain. So they say, you know, it's an original, so let him go. The next day, the same man arrived on the same bicycle with the same bag. After one week or so, young, bright custom officer say, you know, th there must be something wrong with this. It, it doesn't look stupid or, uh, or, or eccentric. So they confiscated the sand and sent it to Madrid to be analyzed. Must be some gold or something. And the answer came, no, there is, no, it is sand, it's only sand. And this young man was rather persistent, so he took the man aside and said, please, tell me why are you taking this sand? I promise, there will be no, no consequences. And the man said, I'm, I'm sparkling bicycles. So, you know, if you, if you see a bicycle and sand, um, don't keep looking at the sand. See that there is a bicycle, too, um, uh, that, that may be of, uh, of, of interest to you as a customs officer. And even if you are not a customs officer, I think you know, when you to look at the picture, don't look just at the things you are shown. See, but there, maybe there are other things that need to be 
uh, to be looked at. So, you know, this is, these are some of, uh, of, of the important tools that one needs as, as a mediator. As, uh, uh, of course, there are all the other things that I'm sure you, you know about as le at least as well as I do. Patience, uh, respect of others, uh, and also uh, trying all the time to see uh, how you can move your, your, your process forward patiently, step by step, until you build something. And you keep reminding yourself, and I, I, I used to remind our young people that, you know, in these situations, nothing is finished until everything is, is, is finished. The other issue that one learns about these past few years, since the end of the Cold War, there is a, there is a very commendable uh, approach by the international situation uh, that want to go and help and uh, solve all the, these uh, uh, conflicts that exist in, in the third world, uh, which is all very good. Uh, I think there is also from the rich countries, uh, most of them anyway, and especially as a matter of fact, you know, the Norwegian, the, the, the Scandinavians, probably more than anybody else, uh, 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 an incredible generosity. You know, uh, I think they are giving now all in all for all sorts of projects and uh, it's not only for peace, peace, operation, peace operations, uh, something like, probably I think it's reaching now 120, 130 billion dollars a year. That is extremely generous and one has to be grateful to all these countries and their people for, for this uh, generosity. For peacekeeping alone, the, the budget of the Department of the United Nations is about six billion dollars. Uh, and the United Nations has now something like uh, 100,000 soldiers. Uh, only the Americans have more soldiers spread over the world, uh, around the world, more than the United Nations. So, you know, you are talking about uh, uh, much generosity, uh, very, very commendable in every, in, in, in every way. There, but are we using these resources well. And there again, if you take a, a, a hard look of, uh, at, at, at the situation, you see that uh, perhaps we are not doing as well as, 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 as we should be doing. To speak more generally than, than about peacekeeping and peacemaking, when I travel in the third world, I don't see uh, the equivalent in terms of development of $120 billion a year. So, you know, if you went to a place that is receiving aid uh, after five years, then the total for the world uh, is $500 billion. I don't see the, the, you know, that, that, that much. So what do we do with that money? I have seen some of, of that in, in the places where I have been. And there, I think, we, we really need to do much better than we are doing now. A report by Oxfam about aid to Afghanistan two or three years ago says that 40%, 40% of bilateral aid given to Afghanistan actually returned to the donor country in the form of salaries and payments for so-called consultants and experts. That's a little bit too much. The rest of the, 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 the remaining 60% do not go to the people they are intended to, all of it. As a matter of fact, even the United Nations, you, you know, they're, they're, uh, I think their uh, numbers uh, as to the manner in which they use their, their, their money is not uh, very, very transparent. And that is why you have people who calculate 
that only 10% actually of the money given to the United Nations for Afghanistan actually go to the Afghans. 90% you have in, goes in, in, in. This is probably too low. The United Nations, if you push them, they will tell you perhaps as much as 70% actually goes to the people and 30% is overhead and so on and so forth. That is, I think it's a little, a little bit too high. Um, maybe 50% in some cases, 40% in others, 60% in, in, in the best cases, actually go to, to, to the people uh, uh, that, 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 that the money is intended to go to. This is what, uh, again, we addressed in the Brahim report that you, you, you mentioned by saying that the international community, when they go somewhere like this, should have a light footprint. This has been you know, immediately misused, as you would expect, uh, including by somebody like uh, Ransfeld, when he was criticized because the Americans have not helped Afghanistan as much as they should have. He said, well, that's because of the Brahimi concept of, foot, of light footprint. But we, we, we did not make that report for the Ministry of Defense of the United States. And I don't think that they read my report. Uh, and at any rate, the light footprint was about the United Nations. What we were saying is that the United Nations should not throw people at problems. We, 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 we have too many people, too many, uh, uh, as the, what the French call budgetivores, you know, people who just uh, eat budgets. Uh, without producing anything or, or doing anything. I'm sure you know this term very well. Uh, um, th this is what we mean by, by light footprint. What we say is that the, the, the resources that we have should be used a little bit more efficiently than, 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 than we are using them. The other thing, much more important and more relevant to the case of uh, peacekeeping, peacemaking, and, and, and so on, is what is it actually that we are doing? We want to end a conflict, that's good, and we want to help the country stand on its own two feet. That is also very good, but how do we do it? We speak of uh, democracy, human rights, um, uh, constitutions, elections, and I suggest to you that these words are uh, perhaps used very, very much out of context. Uh, I, quite often we go to places, and again we go back to that issue of knowledge, with our own very generous aspirations. Uh, you, know, you, you, you see this m uh, better than uh, anywhere else on, on the issue of women. We want women to be equal, we want women to have rights, we want women to participate in the political life, that's good. But when you go to Afghanistan, and you want Afghanistan to have more women in their parliament than the United States, France, and Britain, that is perhaps you know, overdoing it. I'm sure that even women in this uh, audience will agree with me that we, we, we could probably be a little bit more uh, progressive in, in, in our ambitions and our, uh, 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 what we want for, 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 for women. Worse than that, in Afghanistan again, the Minister of Women Affairs uh, came to me one day and said, I desperately need your help. Uh, yeah, what is it? She said, look, all these delegations that come here, everyone says, we have brought with us an advisor for you. So, you know, our small ministry is full of advisors. Uh, we, you know, we, we need advisors, but not that many. Can you please take, uh, see how you can take some, some of them away? Uh, so, you see, this is again a manner in which, uh, we, you know, we don't use our resources uh, properly. About uh, uh, elections, uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, the first few years following that, all our peace, uh, 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 peace operations, 
practically considered that the, the ultimate objective, you know, after putting an, an end to the fighting, is to organize an election. Uh, they called it the exit strategy. It is the exit strategy par excellence. If you organize an election, then democracy has come, and you, you, you declare victory and, 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 and you leave. There again, I think elections are, are very good, very important, indispensable, but they will do the good you expect of them only if they happen at the right time in the right sequence of events that constitute a peace process. If they come too early or at the wrong time, they may even, be, uh, they may, may even do more harm than good. Remember the 1992 election in Angola it was certified as free, fair, and everything. And all it did, it relaunched, it restarted the civil war for 10 years. That is what the, the 1992 elections did. Look at the election in Afghanistan, 20th of August uh, uh, this year. I think if there were any, still any Afghans who believed in democracy, they have stopped believing in democracy now. This is an election that cost two, three hundred million dollars. Um, uh, it has cost the lives of several dozen Afghans and it produced the mess that we know uh, uh, there. I mean, was it really necessary to organize an election for, to, 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 to get to these results? Constitution making is, is the same, if this is the same problem. Yes, countries may need new constitutions or amendments to the existing constitutions. But remember, uh, drafting a constitution takes place between people who disagree on many things, but they, th there is a minimum of confidence between them so that they can sit down and actually establish or, or write down uh, the fundamentals on which their life together is going to be organized and also their life with the rest of the world is going to be organized. Is the end of a conflict and sometimes a period during which the conflict is not finished yet. Is that the best time to, to write a constitution like this? And especially if it is foreigners who do it. I'm sure you must have heard this story about uh, uh, Ayatollah al-Uzma Ali Sistani. It is said that he, he sent a message to Mr. Bremer in Iraq uh, because the Americans actually brought a very bright young professor from New York University to write a constitution for Iraq. And the story is that Ali Sistani sent a message to Bremer saying, Mr. Bremer, you are an American and I am an Iranian. How about the two of us letting the, Iraqian, the Iraqis write their constitution? Uh, the Iraqis did write their constitution with a lot of interference from the Americans and others, but it was done not to an agenda that responded to the needs of the people of Iraq, but it was done on the basis of the needs of the electoral agenda in the United States. The result is an unworkable constitution that Iraq is plagued uh, uh, with. And remember, before the Constitution was ratified, it was announced that it will be amended. I mean, what kind of Constitution is this? That you, 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 you ask people, please ratify it, and we promise we will amend it as soon as we've finished ratifying it. And there is at least one American who played a very, very important role in the drafting of the Constitution, and is very, was very proud of it, and you, uh, his name, I think, is, is, is in the news again, Peter uh, Galbraith. Uh, he said, you know, he was advising the Kurds in, in the, the Christian region, and he said how happy he was with the result. Yet, he went from there to Washington to testify in front of Congress to say this constitution is one unworkable. That is why the only solution is to divide uh, Iraq, uh, Iraq in, in, three, in three countries. 
This is all documented. You, you can see his statement in Baghdad at the end of the drafting of the Constitution. He said, it's great. You know, it speaks on behalf of the Kurds. We got everything we wanted and more. This is great. And you can see his text. It's on the record. In, in front of Congress, I don't remember if it's uh, the Senate or, uh, or the lower house, in which he said, look at this Constitution. It is unworkable. And that is why the country must be divided. So, you know, if this is the manner in which we help countries solve their problems, uh, I think perhaps we should refrain from, from helping them. Uh, as, you know, we are speaking a little bit about Iraq, there is something that I, I feel I must say every, on every occasion. Um, in London, early last year now, in, 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 I think it was in February, 2009, uh, the conference like this, somebody told me, look, if you know, this, all what is happening now, Iraq is more peaceful now, uh, and people seem to be slowly coming together, if uh, democracy is established in Iraq, would you then agree that it was good to invade Iraq? Uh, you know, these are two, 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 two different things. I very, very much hope that Iraq will be a vibrant democracy uh, today, not tomorrow. The earlier the better, and we will be very happy to celebrate that with the people of Iraq. But that, we, that does not, that will not ever change the fact that the invasion was an aggression, that the invasion has destroyed Iraq, and that the invasion was not necessary, not called for, and until now, I don't know why the Americans did it. That, will, that, that, that doesn't change. I very much hope that uh, Iraq will, will do much better than, than, than it has done in, uh, in the recent past. Uh, but this doesn't change the fact, and I'm glad that the British, at least, are trying to ask themselves how their prime minister took them into uh, this uh, terrible war. Um, one or two more things about uh, uh, you know, these uh, lessons that one learns as you go along. Uh, about the United Nations proper. Uh, in, in our report, the Brahimi report, one of the most important recommendations was that the Secretary General must tell the Security Council what it needs to know, not what it wants to hear. Because unfortunately, what we saw was that the Secretary General is submitted to pressure by the big boys in the Security Council who tell him, look, in your report that is, you are bringing to us so that we establish a mission here or there, don't ask for more than 3,000 troops. He says, but you know, we need 5,000. We, we will not give you, so we better ask 3,000. So we will go and ask 3,000. Uh, we have seen the results of that in Rwanda. Uh, I think if you can look at the records, you will see that uh, uh, Boutros Ghali said more than once that uh, you know, the situation is not stable enough and we need more troops. And they, they, they told him, don't, don't ask for more troops, we won't give you that. It has been seen also in Srebrenica. The Security Council adopted the resolution saying that Srebrenica and other places were safe heavens where we, the Security Council, will protect you if you come there. And again, Boutros Ghali told them, look, with the number of troops you are giving me, we cannot really protect these places as safe heavens. They said, no, no, you, you go ahead. You, you go ahead and do it with the number. I think it was... 5,000 or 6,000 troops, mainly Dutch. And we, we, we saw what happened. So we say the, the Secretary General should not give in to such a pressure. If he thinks that you cannot have a, a, a safe haven in Srebrenica at all, he should say so. After our report, Kofi Annan did it once, you know, bluntly like this, uh, in the Congo. If you remember, in 2000 and, uh, 
two or three when all the neighbors practically invaded the Congo and they met, the neighbors met in Lusaka and adopted some vague resolution and it was brought to the council and the council was wanted this, the Secretary General to mount a peace operation to implement this resolution. And Kofi Annan told them, sorry, this is not an implementable resolution. And the, this country went back to the drawing board and they came back with a better, better uh, resolution. And uh, uh, in, we, I think the UN has been able to do a reasonably good job because of that. So this is, this is, this is really vital. The Security Council, since the end of the Cold War, uh, is behaving, uh, I, I, I often say, like a Fabian society. You know, they just sit down and adopt resolutions like students, um, with due respect to the students. I know that they, are, they adopt very serious resolutions. Uh, in, if you remember in, in, in former Yugoslavia, they were adopting a resolution every day. You know, one resolution after the other, one resolution after the other. That's not very serious, and that's not, not acceptable. The second thing about the Security Council is that their cooperation with, with uh, uh, troop-contributing contr troop countries is not what it should be. And after all these missions, uh, is there a problem? Uh, no. Uh -huh. The... Uh, The Security Council adopts a resolution, and then the Secretary General has got to go around to member states and say, please, uh, we have this resolution, we need 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 troops, who is willing to, to, to participate? So, you know, it should, it should take place before the resolution is adopted. Make sure that you are going to have the troops. In Darfur, uh, you know, we, I mean, the United Nations went to the Africans and say, you know, thank you very much, but you haven't done that well with 7,000 troops. It's not enough. We are going to send 26,000 troops. Uh, I think that was four or five years ago. To this day, I don't think they have reached the level of 26,000 troops. And uh, the, the mission needs, I think, about 12 helicopters, attack helicopters, combat helicopters. Until now, they haven't been able to, to, to get them. So what kind of resolutions, what kind of security council is this? More importantly, from my point of view, is the fact that now uh, UN peace operations are uh, really uh, manned almost exclusively by third world countries, rich countries, do not sell their soldiers anymore to, to, to keep the peace. So I, I say very bluntly at the Security Council and elsewhere, this is not the, the kind of division of labor we want to see, that the rich contribute money and the poor contribute blood. I think we, we should be a little bit more uh, more just in, 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 in sharing the costs of international solidarity and international responsibility. Uh, I think those countries that, are, uh, that were poor at one time can certainly pay much more today than they did before. I don't see why China continues to pay something like 2 or 3 percent. Uh, they can pay much, much more than that. India can pay much more than that. Indeed, Algeria can pay more than 0.1% of, of, of the budget of the United Nations. Uh, but at the same time, the United States, France, Britain, Sweden, and so on, should also send their uh, young men and women to uh, uh, wear the blue helmet in, amongst these 100,000 soldiers that are keeping the peace in, 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 in many places in, in the world. Have I gone for too long? I think I have, yeah. Um, so, you know, this, what, what I mean to say is that if, if we speak about the United Nations, the United Nations is definitely the indispensable organization. I don't think we can do without it. Uh, I think that it has lost 
a great deal, unnecessarily, in my opinion, it has lost a great deal of its uh, credibility. The last, uh, it's not only under Ban Ki Moon, I think it started before. And to the credit of Kofi Annan, in one of his last speeches to the General Assembly, he said, we need all of us to work together to restore the credibility and respectability of the United Nations. Uh, I think we, everybody should, should, should uh, uh, participate in restoring that, uh, uh, that credibility. And there is nowhere where that credibility is really at risk, not at risk, has gone, than in our part of the world because of uh, the total uh, inability of the United Nations to do anything for the people of Palestine, except what UNRWA does, and UNRWA is definitely one of the best organizations uh, of, of, the UN, uh, of the UN system. Having said that, I think that uh, the United Nations has learned a great deal, is doing a much, much better job than it used to in, uh, in, in, in the field of peacemaking and peacekeeping. Uh, they are uh, m much more cost effective than um, you know, any other form of, uh, of, of peacemaking or peacekeeping. Uh, there is a man called Jim Dobbins who used to be an ambassador in the United States and who has published a number of books comparing how the Americans do when they, ha they intervene, uh, I mean not in Iraq of course, but uh, when they intervene in, in a benevolent what, manner uh, and the United Nations. And the conclusion was that the United Nations generally does a much better job and at uh, in, in infinitely uh, smaller, smaller cost. So this is very much to the, to the credit of the United Nations. Uh, and I think that you know, in our part of the world also, we are not participating, our governments are not participating very effectively to the, this international effort. The only country that uh, participates in peacekeeping with its soldiers and, 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 uh, 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 and policemen is Jordan. Uh, some countries, including mine, don't participate practically at all. Other countries participate only occasionally, and that is wrong. I hope very much that... Uh, I also hope that uh, you know, this series that you have started will lead to a bigger interest in academia in our part of the world, perhaps starting with your university, in this new field of uh, peacekeeping, peacemaking, and uh, uh, development in the third world. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Lachter. Um, I forgot to mention in the introduction that uh, this talk um, is part of the Bill and Sally Hambrick Distinguished Peacemakers Lectures. I mean, I didn't forget that, I said that, but it also fits into our new program at the Assam Fadis Institute, which is to uh, part of our international affairs uh, side, which is to study, analyze, uh, assess, and monitor the United Nations uh, throughout the Middle East. This is a long-term program headed by our associate director, Dr. Karim Madesi at the Aysan Fares Institute, and we will be doing a whole range of different activities in the years ahead, uh, research um, projects, study groups, uh, conferences, workshops, lectures. Uh, so the idea is to look at everything the UN does, peacemaking, peacekeeping, sanctions, Security Council, development aid, uh, UNRWA, uh, every aspect of the, and the UN is all over the Middle East, and uh, this is our uh, contribution, we hope, to um, what is a growing international field. Uh, so with that, I'd like to um, open it up for uh, questions, um, comments, Where the microphone. Let's start uh, down here. Um, uh, okay, start there in the middle, and then come to, uh, identify yourself, please. 
Hi, my name is Becky Katz. I'm a graduate student here in PSPA. Uh, Sorry, can you hear me? All right. Okay, I'll speak, cl speak closer to the microphone so it's loud. Okay, my computer actually just died. I typed out my question. So um, my question um, is about something you said earlier about the status of women in Afghanistan and the way the UN is handling it. Um, more specifically, I guess I have a question about the, the Bonn Conference, but you had said earlier that um, the head of the Ministry of Women's Affairs said that there was maybe too much uh, foreign involvement and that Afghanistan can't be expected to have as many women in government as certain Western countries. As, many as Western countries, I think you mentioned the US or European parliaments, but um, there was a recent report by the Canadian Ministry of Foreign Affairs that 90% of women in Afghanistan are victims of violence, often the gang rapes that the warlords, not just the Taliban, but since the 90s, and 60% of women are in forced marriages, and the number of self-immolation of women, I think two years ago it was over 200, where women um, set themselves on fire because of the violence against them. So I just sort of wonder, I mean, the UN um, claims to be focusing on the condition of women in Afghanistan, and yet, uh, in the Bonn Conference, the only two women who were allowed to attend uh, were women who were Afghani from the U.S. and Germany. And the only um, civic organization in Afghanistan since the 70s is a women's organization, Rawa, and I'm sure you know them. Um, and they've been providing schools and hospitals in Afghanistan for 30 years, but they weren't included in the conference, I wonder, because they aren't warlords, they didn't kill anyone, and because they aren't elites related to the Shah or intellectuals from the West. So I guess my question is, it doesn't seem like the UN is sincerely addressing the issue of women in Afghanistan, even though sincerely addressing the issue of Afghanistan, and surely the situation is far worse than simply saying that we can't have so many women in government as we do in the West. I mean, what can the UN do? Why was Rawa not included, even though they asked you to participate? Um, and just a few months ago, under Karzai, they passed a law that uh, I know it's too much that uh, if a woman doesn't submit sexually to her husband, she does not have to be fed. So, I mean, the situation is getting worse. So what can be done? Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think all I said, all I said was that it is not, uh, it is not uh, realistic to expect that Afghanistan, for the first time that women participate in politics, has more members of parliament than the United States. That is what I said, that's all. Huh? Um, but you are, you, you are right that the situation of women is deplorable. You are right that we should pay attention to that and see how much we can help that situation to change. But we also have got to realize that that situation will change thanks to the Afghan and the Afghan women in particular. You mentioned Bonn. One of the women who came to see me about participation in, in, in the Bonn conference, I told her, look, you know, these are Afghan organizations that are uh, uh, coming, and they choose their representatives. We will certainly advise them to have as many women as, 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 as possible, but it is their decision at the end of the day, not ours. You know what that woman told me? She told me, I understand that perfectly well. Just help us make peace so that we can go back home and fight for our rights. I think she got it right much better than you did. Um, uh, the, other, the other thing is, I also said that you know, foreigners who come and care for women and want to help the Afghan women, they cannot do it by providing 20 advisors to the small Ministry of Women Affairs in Afghanistan. They can do it in 1,000 other ways, but certainly not by insisting each one of them that, no, 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 the Ministry of Women Affairs must have uh, 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 an advisor on women affairs from our country. Thank you. Um, I'd like to know your opinion about the participation of the United Nations in the quartet. 
I mean, obviously, it's not working. Uh, it's led, obviously, again, by the United States. And um, isn't it compro compromising its neutrality and its independence and basically cancelling the role it could have played otherwise had it not been part of the quartet? Thank you. Um, you know, it is, it is the Secretary General who is a member of the quartet. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm not in the UN anymore. Uh, and I think even if I were in the UN, I would have told you that my personal view is exactly that uh, the Secretary General should have left uh, the Quartet a long time ago. As a matter of fact, Hofe Annan should have left uh, the, the, the Quartet already. Uh, they have absolutely no role there. They are being compromised. And this is one of the things that contributes to their loss of credibility, not only in the region, but in, in, in the world. Uh, thank you very much. I, I found you the, uh, the most critical uh, uh, among all the speakers in the series that uh, Asan Faris uh, hosted. So I'm so glad to hear your criticism vis-a-vis uh, -vis the UN system. But um, um, I, I would like to know if you can elaborate on uh, an epistemological level. My, my, my feeling that UN still uh, succumbed to, uh, to the UN pressure and using the paradigm of good versus evil. Uh, it means that uh, the UN um, uh, officer should not uh, meet with the evil. I remember Dusoto, for instance, telling us uh, in, in the same series that uh, he used to meet with the Khmer Rouge before, during, and after the genocidal uh, uh, operation they, they have done because it was very important for uh, the, the, peace, uh, the peace building. So, do you think that uh, that the, the UN uh, um, after Bush now uh, is still operating in this paradigm that they cannot meet people like Hamas, like Hezbollah, for instance, if we talk uh, in, in the region and others, because they are the evil? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is this is a very good question. Um, you know, unfortunately. Uh, the the um, United Nations, uh, uh, you know, the Middle East is not treated like uh, uh, any other place. Um, you are right that it is the job of the United Nations to meet everybody. That is what is what is what is so unique about the United Nations. It is the universal organization. And when you go, and especially if you are, if you are interested in making peace somewhere, uh, making peace demands that you talk to people even if you personally consider that they are evil. Uh, and definitely not, you, you cannot really I mean, clo I mean, close your door to anybody. This is, you know, the, the, the fundamental principle is that the door of the United Nations is open 24 hours to anybody. So uh, in the Middle East, there is no doubt that uh, uh, you know, the Americans have uh, managed to uh, uh, pressurize the Secretary General and some other countries into adopting their uh, parameters and refusing to meet, for example, Hamas or Hezbollah. To his credit, Kofi Annan, when he came in 2006, I think uh, met with uh, Hezbollah. Uh, and he was, as a matter of fact, you know, that again, he was roughed up and insulted and so on, but he, he, he did uh, meet. Uh, uh, you are absolutely right. The United Nations has got to have its door open. And this is, as a matter of fact, our problem, t to be fair, not only with the United States. You have a lot of, uh, you know, extremely uh, people acting with, with the best of intentions, with the best of, you know, idealism telling you that you know, the Taliban, for example, considering their, their, uh, their attitude to women, you, the United Nations must not speak to them. I think this is wrong. 
how are you going to make peace in Afghanistan if you don't talk to the most important organization in the country? You have to talk to them. Uh, so it's not only the United uh, uh, States that, uh, and, and, and in the case of Israel in particular, that pressurized the United Nations, but also people who are uh, you know, uh, out of uh, idealism and, and the best of intentions in the world also would like to, uh, uh, you know, to prevent the United Nations from uh, keeping this, uh, uh, this open door uh, policy. Yes, in your opinion, you don't think this lack of credibility by United Nations and this cooperation among United Nations and the U.S. Army and the U.S. administration is rising extremism? The what? What is rising? The, the cooperation among the United Nations and the, the U.S. administration are rising or pushing extremism against the West. Do you think so? Uh, did you say that the cooperation between the United Nations and the U.S. is rising? Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, you know, it's not a cooperation. I mean, you know, the United States is the most important uh, member of the United Nations. They pay 25 percent of its budget. Uh, so, cooperation with the United uh, States is uh, is it's not that it's not wrong. It is necessary. It is good. The thing is, we the United Nations represents the United States plus. 191 other countries. And the agenda it works to should not be a U.S. agenda. Uh, it, it should work definitely. Uh, and w w I think the United Nations welcomes more, not less, participation by the United States, but not to, to, to an exclusively U.S. agenda. Joe Hallu, I'm a graduate of AUB and uh, the University of Toronto, and in one of my classes I read the Brahim report, all of it. It's a great uh, report. And I just wanted to uh, ask two sub-questions about um, nation, uh, basically uh, peacekeeping operations. In peacekeeping operations, uh, we realized that at many points that the UN often uh, sends peacekeeping uh, operations to countries that have no well-defined uh, nation in a sense, uh, no. a defined nation. So basically, uh, do you think in your personal opinion that the United Nations should be focusing on nation building in its future peacekeeping operations? Uh, that's one. And two, um, do you think that peacekeeping operations should also focus on issue areas as in advising for the construction of infrastructure roads, pavements, schools, hospitals, everything that, uh, quote-unquote, uh, gets to the people's hearts. Thank you. Um, you know, the, the United Nations works in its member states. Uh, now, I think it is really a universal organization. I don't think there is, uh, there, is any, there is one tiny little island that is not member of the UN. So when there is a problem somewhere, the United Nations goes there, with it, whether it is uh, a failed state or uh, a state that is functioning. Uh, if it is needed, it will go there. Uh, what it does there, you know, when you are talking about peacemaking, peacekeeping, you are talking about places where there is a conflict or where there has been a conflict. Where there has been no conflict, the United Nations does things that are different, uh, as I'm sure you, you know. WHO has eradicated one or two diseases uh, all over the world. It's uh, 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 UNICEF um, and, and, and organizations like that do uh, work in, 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 in their respective fields. But when you go to a place where there has been a conflict, where there is a conflict, then you are talking about re-establishing peace and then helping that country stand on its own two feet. There, I think what uh, perhaps the criticism is that uh, we far too often, the United Nations and others, NGOs, countries that are interested in any given place where there is a conflict, we tend to make wild promises uh, that raise expectations and we do not deliver. 
So that creates frustration, anger, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are, you know, different views there. My personal view is that, you know, we should, when we go somewhere, we must make, make it very, very clear. When the United Nations goes somewhere, they must make it very clear that, you know, they are coming to give a helping hand for a short period of time and with limited means. And that uh, it is up to the country and its people to really make the best of that opportunity. And uh, ultimately, they'll have to count on themselves to rebuild uh, their country. There's a fellow on top left there with his hand up. And then at the far back row there, he will be the next one. And then we'll take them in order as I write them down. Hello, um, my name is Jad Namani. I'm a business undergraduate student here. I just wanted to ask you, how do you suggest the UN rebuilds its credibility in the region, mainly the Middle East? Um, I think it's both very difficult and very easy. <laughs> it is very difficult in the sense that, uh, you know, we've got to be realistic. Uh, the United Nations is an organization that belongs to its members. And quite often, the Secretary General is told, uh, you know, it is not the United States that is asking you to do this, that, or the other. It is mo many members, because many members, as a matter of fact, are susceptible to pressure by the United States. So I think we have got to remember that. Uh, it is very easy because uh, there is absolutely no reason why the Secretary General sends a mission to look at what happened in Gaza. This is not the Goldstone uh, mission, because the Goldstone mission was not sent by him. It was sent by the Council on Human Rights in Geneva. The Secretary General sent before Goldstone a small mission to go to Gaza, led, as a matter of fact, by a, a, a wonderful man called Ian Martin, former Secretary General of uh, uh, Amnesty International. Uh, to look only at what happened to the UN, its uh, property, and its people. That is already, you know, something difficult to accept. The Secretary General is not a small NGO to send somebody look at what happened to that NGO. It's the United Nations. All right. He, he, he sent the man just to look at UN property and UN people. Ian Martin goes back and gives him a report, of course very critical, of what happened to the United Nations in Gaza, and making some recommendations. Pressure by the Israelis and the Americans immediately, and the Secretary General says, okay, w w w the, this report will not have any follow-up. I mean, there is absolutely no reason why he, he, he should do that. Uh, property of the United Nations has been destroyed. People working for the United Nations have been uh, hurt. People who hid behind the flag of the United Nations have been killed. Uh, so, you know, he, he can't. He should say to the rest of the world, terribly sorry, we've got to look into this. And this is what Goldstone has done. And you've seen all, all, all uh, the, how hell broke loose because of that. Way at the back there, the very top. My name is Antoine Laham. I would like to ask you uh, about your personal assessment of the provincial reconstruction team that they were criticized by development and humanitarian workers in Afghanistan Be because of the confusion made uh, between military participating in humanitarian and development and uh, the non-respect of the international humanitarian law and so on. My second question is, uh, during your international career, you work with three secretary general and you accompanied the transition process. These days there are uh, rising, uh, rising criticism of the non-performance of the current secretary general uh, with some ideas to uh, not to renew for him and the name of the Nobel Peace Prize, Jose Ramos Horta, is on the platform. First, I want to know 
what are uh, what are these are these criticism founded and uh, will he has another mandate or where are we going on thank you um, you know on the issue of uh, what is generally called humanitarian space uh, humanitarian organizations uh, meaning really NGOs uh, are nervous when uh, they they are in the same place with, uh, uh, with military people. And especially when military people are doing work that is similar uh, to theirs. And they say that, uh, you know, the reason why they say that, it's because they say their life is threatened. Because the military are seen as enemies by at least part of the population. And if they are seen to be doing the same work, people will confuse, uh, make a confusion between the military and the civilians, and the civilians will be attacked. Uh, in situations like Haiti, for example, it is not very difficult to, uh, to, to address these very legitimate uh, concerns. In a place like Afghanistan, it's a little bit more difficult because Afghanistan is at war now. Uh, and there is a confusion between the military and the civilians, and not really because the military are doing the same work as the uh, as uh, the same work as uh, 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 as the civilian NGOs. The confusion in Afghanistan comes from the fact that the Taliban, in particular, and our insurgents and other insurgents, say that anybody who is supporting our government is an enemy. Uh, whether you are in civilian uh, dress or, or a, a, in, in a military uh, uniform is, is the same for them. And you've seen that they attack a UN residential compound. Uh, I think the United Nations is very well known. Or no, everybody knows who the UN is. Uh, so in, in Afghanistan, this, it's, not, it's not anymore this issue that is, uh, uh, that is a problem. The problem is that the war is becoming uh, more and more vicious, and the insurgents, uh, they don't hide the fact that uh, they don't want any foreigners, and that foreigners who are helping the government are their enemies. Uh, on Ban Ki-moon, I didn't work with Ban Ki-moon. I left the United Nations before he, before he, was, before he was even elected, really. Um, I, have, I have done a few things for the United Nations uh, since then, from outside, uh, I did work with, with uh, uh, Boutros Ghali and, and Kofi Annan, who are both, uh, who were and are still very good friends. I would rather not comment very much on Ban Ki-moon because it would be unfair. I, I don't know the man that well. Uh, whether he will be re-elected or not is a bit too early to say. Good evening. My name is Philip Zreib. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Business, and I also represent the School of Business on the advisory board of the ASAM Ferris Institute. It is obviously a pleasure and a privilege to, to hear you. Uh, if you will allow me, I'd like to ask a question about Lebanon. And if it's about off subject, I don't mind if Lebanon. you skip it. Lebanon. Was that okay? How about Lebanon? Uh, I'm assuming you find Lebanon today at its best by your experience, because you also have seen Lebanon at its worst. My question is, by your assessment today, do you see us, Lebanese society, robust enough to make it forward towards peace? Consequently, as President Carter, on his last visit with us here, said, there is room for peace with Israel, and a week later, Israel attacked there is, Gaza. There is what? what did he say? He said, there is room for peace with Israel, uh, I'm paraphrasing. These were not his exact words, but he was proposing that there are ways to move forward. And that within a week later, Israel savagely attacked Gaza in the most ferocious way. So beyond Lebanese society being robust for peace, do you see peace with Israel for us in Lebanon? Thank you. Um, you know, peace with Israel is not only for Lebanon, it's for everybody else. Um, that 
Lebanese society is robust is something I saw during the worst time in Lebanon, as you say. Uh, it was really fantastic to see, uh, you know, houses destroyed one day and then you drive by the next day and people are rebuilding it already. Uh, whether, you know, peace with Israel uh, is, I think, I think all Arab countries have accepted the principle of peace with Israel. Uh, it was, as a matter of fact, in Lebanon that a resolution has been adopted offering total peace to Israel uh, if, if Israel uh, accepted the creation of uh, a viable Palestinian state. So, uh, you know, we give the impression that it is us who are refusing peace. It is really Israel who is refusing peace. Uh, whether that peace will come, yes, I think it will come. Whether it will come in our lifetime, that I'm, I, I, I really don't know. More importantly, whether it will come after another war or another two wars or another three, uh, three wars, that also I don't know. The lady in Thank you. Um, my name is Senja Korhonen and I come from Finland and I work for a crisis management centre which uh, trains and recruits civilian experts for European Union and for, Uni for European Union and uh, United Nations missions and uh, I would like to thank you for, for your uh, presentation and all the criticism you um, gave towards the um, current missions and working in the field, um, I also recognize all, all this criticism. And um, there, um, in the field, there is a lot of discussion going on on the division of labor between regional organizations and the United Nations and on the um, coordination and cooperation between these different actors because it is being seen that the uh, regional organizations, European Union, NATO, African Union, are taking over some of the tasks of the U United Nations. So could you please um, elaborate on, on how um, the division of, of labor between these different international organizations could be done so that uh, we would be able to better build peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think if these series are about learning lessons, I think that we learn by recognizing our mistakes much better than uh, from bragging about our successes. Uh, there's no wrong with bragging of successes when they do exist. Uh, but I think it is, even when there are successes, it is more important to speak of uh, one's uh, mistakes and failures. That is where you learn, where you really learn. That is the lessons that need to be learned. Uh, I'm, uh, I've left the United Nations, uh, but I, I, I'm a great believer in the United Nations. I'm a great admirer of the United Nations, and I think that the United Nations is doing a job that nobody else can do. Uh, regional organizations are, I think it, 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 is, it is very, very welcome development that regional organizations are taking some of the burden, are, sh are sharing the burden with, uh, with the United Nations. And in some areas, they're doing reasonably well, in some areas perhaps very well. Uh, the, the European Union is extremely generous with their money. They, ha they, they have plenty, you know. But it's so difficult to get at it. I can, I'm sure you know that. Uh, it, it is more bureaucratic than the United Nations, and I'm sure you know that too. Uh, so there is, there is no, no, no problem there. Uh, you know, they, what, the, what the regional organizations are doing, they are not taking away anything from the United Nations. They are helping the United Nations, and that is great. 
coordination is a terrible headache. It is a really terrible headache. Uh, and I don't think we are good at it. In Afghanistan, when I was there, we tried several manners of, uh, of, of coordination. Yeah, we were not successful. They are, again, a drawing board to see how they can, they can do better. Uh, but there again, I think, perhaps I was not very explicit, we start by reducing our numbers. Uh, there are too many European Union people, too many UN people, too many NGOs. Uh, I think in Afghanistan there is perhaps you know, 1,000, 2,000 NGOs. Out of those, there are 50 that are doing tremendously good work. Maybe another 50 that are doing medium work and quite a few that are totally useless and perhaps one or two are doing harmful work. Uh, I didn't mention, and I think this is also something I like to mention on every occasion. Uh, some of you have heard of an NGO called L'Arche de Zoe, French NGO, that was in Chad a year ago or maybe a little more. They stole children from the poorest families telling them we are taking your children to school. And they were actually smuggling them out to take them to France for adoption. If, if this is the NGOs that uh, uh, you, know, you are sending us, please keep them, keep them at home. To, to add insult to injury, they were caught by the Chadians before they took the children. They were arrested, they were sentenced, and France, of course, exercised pressure on, on Chad and Chad agreed to allow them to serve their term of prison, I think it was four or five years or something, in France. As soon as they got to France, I think after a few weeks, three months, something, they were released. This is, you know, this is totally unacceptable. It is totally unacceptable of such an NGO, and it is totally acceptable of a big country, respected country like France. So you know, this, this is also part of, of the problems that, uh, that we are facing. Um, we're going to have two more questions from the audience, and then I'm going to ask, and, and then I think we need to bring it to a close, um, or maybe a couple more, because there's a lot of people want to ask. Let me ask a, a question first. In the meantime, the next one will be the lady with the scarf here, and if you could bring it to the guy with the scarf down here, um, so they can be next. I'm going to ask you two questions, if I could. Could you explain to us, in your view, the significance of the Security Council unanimous decision to set up the court to try the people accused of killing Rafi Hariri and the investigation. That struck many of us as a historic, unprecedented decision. Um, how do you evaluate it in its history? And do you see it uh, f uh, fizzling out at all? Um, or is that commitment still strong? That's the easy question. The hard question is, uh, well, not hard. When you were involved in the mediation at Ta'if to end the Lebanese Civil War, you were an envoy of the Arab League, a special envoy. And you've been an envoy of the United Nations Secretary General. How do you compare and contrast the two experiences? Is, was, does one of them help you uh, work better than the other? Um, well, you know, the easy question is, uh, is, is an impossible question. Uh, you, know, you are right that uh, that was unprecedented. I think that you know, the, the sense of outrage unanimously expressed by the people of Lebanon kind of uh, rubbed off the international community. And they did something they have not, never, done, not, never done before. The United Nations is not in the business of creating uh, tribunals for individual uh, cases like that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that they will want the uh, tribunal to uh, do the job for which it has been created, but this is very highly political, and I think they will be in touch with you. With, I mean, with your, they, they definitely are in touch with your government, with governments of other countries, with the permanent members of the Security Council to see how uh, this will be carried for, uh, forward. I, I don't want to express any view on the subject uh, in Lebanon or anywhere else on this subject. Uh, uh, Taif, uh, you know, it doesn't really 
make a difference whom you are working for. Uh, the, the big issue, and this perhaps we should have talked a little bit more about, is how much support you, 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 you have. Because, you see, uh, uh, you know, I should have also perhaps said that uh, you know, I had two, two periods in Afghanistan, 97 to 99, and then after 9-11, from 2001-2004. Um, I resigned in 1999. And I told the Security Council, I'm, you know, I've done everything I know. I've got nowhere. Mainly because you, the Security Council, have sent me there. But the Afghans I'm dealing with know that you are not interested in Afghanistan. You are not, uh, you know, Afghanistan is, you know, the, remember we are in 99. The, the Cold War is finished. The Russians have been defeated. Soviet Union has disappeared. Who cares about this tiny little country in the middle of nowhere, poor, destitute, if its people want to kill one another? So the, the Afghans know that I'm, I'm, I have come with no support. And that is why I'm not getting anywhere. Taif, you know, I think, first the Arabs realized that uh, Lebanon was breaking up. For the first time in 1998, they failed to elect a president. For the first time, you had two governments, one in Baghdad and one in the Saraya, competing for international and regional uh, uh, recognition. So the Arabs, I think, uh, took the problem seriously. And I had a lot of support from them. Not only that, we went on behalf of this tripartite committee to all those who had any influence here. So I think people in Lebanon I was dealing with, they knew that, you know, I, I just met the Pope. I met, uh, what's his name, the man who was Prime Minister for, for in, in, in England uh, in those, you know, after, after Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, yeah, John Major, uh, 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 Francois Mitterrand. Uh, in America I didn't meet the President, but I met a lot of people. Uh, the Secretary General of the United States, of the, of the United Nations. So I think the Lebanese knew that, you know, what I was telling them had a lot of support behind it. So it doesn't matter whom you are working for if you have the real kind of support that, uh, that, uh, that, that is noticed by the people you are dealing with. The lady in the scarf Thank you. Um, hi, thank you for coming. My name is Teodora Burkova, and I'm actually a recent graduate of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. Um, my question is about the sustainability of peace processes. And I'm bearing in mind that each situation is different. I'm wondering if there are any lessons you can share with us um, as to what components are necessary in making a peace agreement last. Um, and then my second question is, um, I'm wondering how you envision the UN changing in the next 10 to 15 years, and more specifically, how you think they'll be able to address climate change and other newer issues, which are also inherently, will be more and more, in my opinion, linked um, to conflicts around the world. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you are absolutely right. One of the very big problems we face uh, is that you, know, you, you, you help achieve peace somewhere and then that crumbles and uh, war starts again. And that happens, I think, in easily 50% uh, of the cases. Uh, there is, as you said, uh, you know, no two situations are alike. Uh, that is why also you need this navigation by sight. You know, you go with all your experience and your knowledge and so on and so forth, yet you've got to tailor whatever process you are working on to that particular place in that particular time with those particular people. Uh, but perhaps one of the things that are common and indispensable is that this peace process is owned by the majority of the people you are dealing with, uh, genuinely owned by them, that they believe in it. And 
that they consider it as their own and they implement it as their own. Uh, I think this is probably the most important element. It is also necessary that you know, the international community keeps its interest alive. Uh, unfortunately, with what's happening, you know, the CNN effect, uh, we follow CNN all over the world, so you, know, you, you have a sexy problem today, and that stops being sexy as soon as something sexier appears uh, you know, at the other end of the, of the world. Uh, you know, the international community has got to keep its interest uh, going. And the future of the UN, how will it Well, I have replied to that. <laughs> um, I, I mean, the short answer is that I don't know. I, I, I think I said several times, I consider that it is the indispensable organization. As you know, the Americans played with the idea at some stage of creating what they call the uh, alliance of democracies. I think that idea is, has never been really, uh, has never had any future and it's, it is dead. Um, the United Nations will be important or less important depending on what it does in any particular situation uh, and also how much interest uh, it, uh, it, it re generates amongst its members, government, and also amongst its people. Uh, in the United States until Iraq, uh, even if the, you know, during some Republican gov Congresses, the government of the United States was not very interested in the UN, there was consistently a majority of people supporting the United Nations in, the, in, in, in America. Uh, and I believe even now there is, there is a majority of people supporting the, 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 the United Nations. But I think the United Nations has got to do better. Uh, you've mentioned climate change. Uh, who has failed in this? Uh, it is the government sitting, it's true, as members of the United Nations. But it is, it is the member states. You see, the, 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 this is what I, when we speak about the Arab League, it's easier to, 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 to make the point. But the same point can be made about the, uh, the, the, the United Nations. Uh, people complain that the Arab League is useless and it's doing nothing and so on. I say, you know, wh whom are you talking about? It's not Amr Musa. The Arab League is you. you know, it's a kind of family picture. If you don't like your family picture, that is you know, not the fault of Amr Musa. Uh, change a photograph or something. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. I'm Farah al-Muslimi, a UB undergraduate student in public administration. I have two brief questions. One is, as one of the people, two brief. <laughs> no. As one of the people who, 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 who made the Taif agreement, are you happy about how it has far gone today? What's your evaluation for a Taif agreement today? Are you happy in how you see Lebanon today? What's just like your evaluation? My second question is, I think, I think you had played a role in solving some conflicts back uh, days in Yemen. Is, can we see something like that today on the personal level, on the UN level, on anything like that? Sure. Because it has been go, going really bad. Thank you. Are you from Yemen? Yes. Good. <laughs> um, yeah, well, to start with, uh, you know, Taif. The question was first was about Taif, is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, look, uh, Taif. Uh, you know, I, I, I speak about Taif only from a historical point of view. What happens to Taif today? You ask your Lebanese friends here; they, they will tell you. Um, uh, what I what I see as somebody who participated, uh, not as much as people think, but I, I was around when it, it happened. Uh, I, I'm I'm happy that it. It helped uh, end the war. That's not a mean, mean achievement, I think. Um, the, what I see is that the Lebanese, you know, in the morning they say it's very good, in the afternoon they say it's bad. Uh, so, so uh, but I hope they will come up with something much better than Taif, uh, and the sooner the better. About Yemen, yes, I was involved in 1994 in the civil war. 
Um, I didn't do much there, really, I didn't do much. Although the Yemenis think I did a great deal. They even gave me a decoration for it. But don't tell them that uh, uh, I didn't do much. Um, now, I was in Yemen in August. Uh, and I think that everybody realizes out there that the situation is really very bad. And uh, I think the earlier that we have a genuine reconciliation, and the Yemenis are very good at that. You know, they are very bad when they fight. They are very good when they make peace. Uh, and if they want help, I think that help will definitely be available. It will be available from individuals like myself. It will be available from organizations like the Arab League and it will be available from organizations like the United Nations. Uh, but whether they do it alone or with support from outside, it is terribly urgent that it, it does take place. The lady there, then will be the last question. Uh. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Leila Berri. I'm a student from Morocco, majoring in political science, undergraduate. Uh, okay. So you've served as a diplomatic advisor to the, to the Algerian president uh, between uh, 1982 and 1984. Uh, uh, during this period, Algeria was highly involved in the uh, issue of Western Sahara. Uh, and you also served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Algeria from 1991 and 19, uh, 1993. And it was this, during this period that the United Nations uh, had uh, scheduled uh, the referendum for Western Sahara, the self determination uh, referendum. Um, so assuming such uh, positions, you, you, you must have dealt with this uh, issue uh, personally. Uh, so my questions are like, um, what, did, what, what role did personally in resolving such a uh, conflict? And uh, as I said, the, the UN mission scheduled the, uh, a referendum in 1991, but it never took place. It was rescheduled and rescheduled, but until now there was no referendum. Um, so. Uh, what do you think? Will be there a referendum someday for Sahrawis to determine their um, uh, their, their future? Uh, and uh, what about the James Baker plan? Uh, the, the what? The James Baker plan. The James Baker. James Baker. Yeah, James Baker plan um, uh, in 2004. Uh, the, is it still valid or did it die? And uh, what, what's your assessment of the uh, Moroccan autonomy plan? Okay, thank you. Wow. <laughs> well, I congratulate you uh, that you know so much about uh, the Sahara. Ah, I see. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, She's also yeah, yeah, well, you know, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm terribly sad as, as a Maghrebi uh, that this problem exists, that this problem has not been solved and that the borders between your country and mine have been closed for so long. I'm terribly, terribly unhappy. Um, who is responsible for this situation? Um, I will definitely not uh, you know, point the finger at anyone. I just say that both countries should do much better than they have. I know that it's not easy because, as you said, I happen to be close enough to the center of power in one of the two countries twice, and I haven't done much. Uh, anyhow, I haven't, I haven't, I mean, the problem was not solved when I was, when I was around, and it's not, it's not solved yet. Um, we definitely had much better relations in, uh, in Morocco and Algeria had much better relations in the 80s than they did after the uh, 90s. Uh, the Baker plan has been rejected by Morocco. The Moroccans have put out a, an autonomy uh, plan and there are some episodic discussions uh, that doesn't seem to be get, going anywhere between uh, the Moroccans and Polisario under the auspices of uh, the United Nations. Uh, th there was some talk about a meeting that has just taken place or is going to take place soon, but not much has happened. So, you know, the, the short answer is that 
I'm very sorry uh, that uh, this situation exists, and I hope that our leaders will, will, will be wiser than they have been until now. Um, um, Lebanese and Algerian labor laws dictate that we can only work elder statesmen for an hour and 40 minutes, so we've reached the limit. Um, I, uh, <laughs> we've passed the limit. Um, but, uh, well, we, we, did, we wanted to get every um, minute of your time and thoughts. To, before we uh, f finish, I just wanted to <clears throat> thank uh, our Associate Director, Karim Maqdisi, whose Maqdisinian charm was partly responsible for bringing Lakhda Brahimi here, and uh, Tara Mahfoud and Zeki Boulos from the Assam Fares Institute, who did all the hard work. Again, also Bill and Sally Hambrecht for uh, endowing this uh, lecture series and the Assam Fares family for uh, getting our institute going. I want to thank them all. Um, they are what allow us to do these kinds of activities. All of you for coming, thank you. And Lakhtar Brahimi, it's been a real pleasure and honor, and uh, we hope to have you back again. Thank you very much.